We'll make you return that back. Thank you. And uh, now we introduce uh, tonight's performer, uh, Dr. Tapo. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Thank you all for coming. I, I wanted to say hello because I'm always thrilled to 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 invite our wonderful performer tonight. And we always invite him back because not only is he a spectacular pianist, not only is he a great entertainer, but what he does most of all, he describes what he's going to do. He does it in a short, clear, precise, understandable way. So Robert, take over. <laughs> short, clear, and precise. Well, I don't know about that. Thank you, Rich, and thank you, Don, and also Cliff and Rose, and everybody for making this possible. I always love coming back here. It's a big crowd, so do you hear me okay? This is good. Yeah. So I do tend to yeah talk a lot. So with the hopes of dinner, getting dinner, I'll try to keep it you know a little bit. Having a Russian mom and. South Southern Virginia dad that's talking. So this program is kind of unusual. You know, it's a violin program. Why, why did I do this? Well, during the pandemic, um, when our, both our kids were born actually, it was a weird time, lack of sleep and all that, but I got very obsessed with violin music. First and foremost, my great hero, Avery Gitlis. Look him up, great violinist and personality. You know, he played not like a classical player, but like a gypsy. And it's in the best sense of that, you know? And he died, unfortunately, December, New Year's Eve, no, Christmas Eve in 2020. And it affected me a lot. And I just dove into his recordings, and then of course, got into watching the PBS Art of Violin, where he's a speaker. And of course, Nathan Milstein, Yasha Heifetz, all these great violinists of the past. And I told my wife, who's also a pianist, I said, well, I, I kind of want to switch. I'm sick of piano. <laughs> <laughs> How much piano can you deal with this box? <laughs> Richter called it a coffin. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and so she said, yeah, you can. I know someone who did. You have to practice maybe 10, 12 hours a day. And I said, I'm lazy. I can't do that. So the next best thing would be to just play the violin arrangements on the piano. So that's what I've been doing. I've been on and off with this program, and it's, it's a weird. Anyway. So, the first piece, um, and I'll refer even to a few great recordings that I love, because the recordings are as much part of these as the pieces, I mean, the works themselves. A word about arrangements or transcriptions, sometimes not fashionable to do. I happen to love them, because I can be something that I'm not, <laughs> like a violinist. Um, but an arrangement or transcription is like a translation. If you read a good translation of a novel or even a poem, it's very important that the translator is a great writer themselves and that they're able to not only literally convey what the original says, but to really make it idiomatic. So, you know, Horowitz in an interview, he said, he said, we should, as pianists, we should learn from extra musical, I mean, non pianistic sources. Listen to singers, listen to violinists, just don't listen to pianists. So, <laughs> That's, I guess I'm trying to follow that. Anyway, um, so all of these arrangements, uh, there's they're a spectrum. Some of them are more free than others. But at any rate, I think there's, there's merit in that the arrangers are as much important as the original composer. So the first piece, the Chacon in D minor by Bach, is a famous piece. It's for solo violin, which is, you know, just an unadorned thing. And there's a story behind this piece. Supposedly, Bach, who went on many trips to hear performers like Bucks to Huda, no relation. I'm Bucks, but it's no relation. Uh, I wish. I should say that. You know, Bucks to Huda. Anyway, so, you know, he was coming back from one of these trips on foot. He didn't have a Cadillac, you know, he just walked. And he um, comes home and he finds out the news that his first wife, Maria Barbara, had died. And that's the story that he wrote this right after. And of course, Bach was a church musician. He was very religious. And he puts into this, I would say you hear a lot of hymn music, but you also hear a lot of you know, dark things, maybe from the Book of Revelation or something. It's a very, very imposing piece. Brahms, who did his own arrangement of this piece, he wrote, he arranged it for solo left hand, which I'm not going to do because that, that's got to hurt. <laughs> um, but, he, he did it, but he told Fire 
Josh Schumann, who, well, I'm not going to do gossip tabloid, but they, they had a, you know, they, they were friends, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they were, yeah, I mean, it's not clear. But anyway, the point is that he, in a letter to Clara Schumann, we learn a lot from the letters, he said that if I had this music in my head, for one single state, for one instrument, single violin, I would go mad. Fascinating. So, you know, that's the story. And I think it portrays the stages of grief. And you know, I'm joking around and everything, but me and my whole family, we are deeply grieving right now the loss of my uncle who died very suddenly. Funerals were Saturday. So I think of him when I play this because all those stages of grief are in here. You hear it, and they're not necessarily in order. There's the anger, and then there's the acceptance, and all of that, it's all there in this. Uh, Bach is universal in that sense. And so, what Buzzoni does, of course, is he arranges it for piano, he thickens it out, turns it almost into like an organ piece. And he's added a lot to it. So, one final thing I'm talking about. So, the Chacon, what is a Chacon? It is a, it's a type of a dance, actually. It's a, considered, I think, a Spanish dance, but some sources I've read say it comes from Latin America, even. It's kind of interesting. The Native Americans in Latin America, maybe, I don't know. But it's a kind of a wild dance. It's, it's, I think it's a mournful dance. You know, it reminds me a bit of another dance, the Tarantella, which was done when in Naples, when you were bitten by a tarantula. You were supposed to do this dance before medicine was, you know, was developed. Do this dance and it would remove this, the spell, right? Well, I think of a chacon as that for grief, perhaps. I don't know. But anyway, uh, here is the, the chacon that's, uh, I guess I'm talking because it's, it's such a monumental piece, I don't know. So, good luck. And <laughs>
some recordings of him even somewhat of an overlooked figure I mean not really but look into him he's fascinating what he did Buzzoni wrote a piano concerto it's like an hour and a half or more <laughs> it's got a male chorus in it not a lot of people do it um, <laughs> but um, apparently he did so many arrangements of Bach that when he went to restaurants uh, with his, he'd go with his wife, and the, the waiter would say, oh, is this for Mr. and Mrs. Bach Buzzoni? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the next set of pieces is actually, I, I'm changing the program a tad, not till the very end though, so I'm gonna do those Pagnini ones once I catch my breath a little, because um, those are also crazy, very crazy. But I have some more intimate pieces towards the end, so don't worry. <laughs> um, it's not all fire and brimstone. So the, um, Paganini was fascinating because if you look at his dates, it coincides with the so-called classical composers, Mozart, Haydn, and, you know, which we associate with more, I don't know, reserve, purity, balance, although I don't think those are necessarily the case, like Mozart's Requiem is not balanced and pure, but, um, but at any rate, um, he was a tour de force. He was kind of sui generis, Paganini. He just came out of nowhere almost. And his style was just his. It, 
doesn't really come from a tradition necessarily the way everyone else did. <laughs> he was just tagging me. And he, he was this very thin guy and he would play this crazy, in this crazy way, people thought he was possessed by the devil. <laughs> Literally, and of course in those days, that was, well, I guess nowadays there are people like that, but anyway. <laughs> um, but he was really, people thought he was really possessed, he was mad. And he was a huge inspiration for Liszt. Because Liszt was, interestingly enough, he was kind of a prodigy, but then he ends up in Paris. Long story, his father died, he wanted to become a priest, his dad on his deathbed said, don't be a priest. And it was just this constant, you know, thing. Actually, that's going to be a theme that's going to come back at the end here. Anyways, um, he was depressed, actually, list. And he was teaching a lot. He wasn't doing a whole lot. And finally, he hears Paganini one day. Am I bleeding? No, it's good. It means I, I really got to yeah. So um, then, um, so he hears Paganini, and it just, it just wakes him up. And the story goes, and I think it's true, he locked himself in a room for like a few years, practiced 12 hours a day while reading Goethe, Dante, and Shakespeare, because the guy was not educated, so he educated himself. And it's like a Rocky Balboa story, and he comes out and he's list, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Except for a little thinner. So that's, that's the story. And it's really like that. It's really like, and the first things he did was he transcribed some of Paganini's uh, violin music. So uh, the, the caprices mainly for solo violin. And just like the Buzzoni, Bach, you just heard of Bach Buzzoni, there's a lot of rearranging going on. And it's, it's not just a you know literal thing. So the first one is called tremolo because that's what happens. It's, it's just you know, at my espresso today to keep that going. Um, what else was I going to say? Oh yeah, because um, I forgot to do this. I heard that there's a version of these by Buzzoni. Buzzoni rearranged them as a third arrangement. And those are what I'm going to play today because I heard them a few weeks ago and I thought, I like those. So I, I redid it a little bit. Um, <laughs> I don't think Liszt would mind because he redid these several times. And it's also, th this is an interesting topic and I don't want to go down this tangent, but um, the idea of purity. Nowadays we're obsessed with getting the urtex, the exact, you know. But it was, there, in those days, you know, people rearranged stuff all the time to fit their hands. Mahler reorchestrated Mozart to make it sound more up to date. <laughs> so I don't know. Um, I think that's what Buzzoni is kind of doing. So anyway, to the pieces, I, I calmed down a little. So the first one is the tremolo, and it's uh, it should really say Paganini dash list dash Buzzoni. So. <laughs>
drinking the wine, you won't notice the little <laughs> finger slips. Anyway, so the next one is a totally different character. My wife makes this really a stupid piece. And, and I trust her because she is a musician, a very great musician. Uh, so, well, she says it sounds like our two cats chasing each other, uh, which it does. But I also added to her that we have these great conversations. And I said, well, you know, comedy can be deeper than tragedy. The Greeks felt that, the ancient Greeks. So she said, well, OK, but I still think it's a stupid piece. <laughs> well, it's, um, it's a silly piece, and it's comic. And I think that in classical music, you know, that term itself is a strange one. It's, we tend to think of it as being always serious. Well, it's not. And this is, this is an example of something fun, uh, except the middle part is not so, so funny. <laughs> so, anyways. Well, the part I'm referring to is this, this idea here. That's the cat tune. Uh, sounds like that.
famous, but Yabuzoni did change this one considerably. So if you hear me doing the beginning, for example, he doesn't do what Liszt did. Uh, he does that later. So he starts, it's, it's, this is really rewritten. The, the first two I played, Buzoni added a few different things, but it was pretty faithful to what Liszt did. Well, this is not today's, so. Um, the campanella is it's a little bell. This is from, I think it's the second, uh, no, 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 the violin concerto of Paganini, the last movement. So uh, this is, unlike the other two, it's not built from solo violin caprices. So okay, this is another really crazy one. Then we move on to some more intimate things. So I'm getting a little tired here. Let's get one sip of water and then we'll do a campanella. So you're going to hear that little bell sound as it's recurring this, this constantly. So.
less crazy pizza. <laughs> I'm going to play now, this is the Serenade by Schubert, arranged by Liszt. It's originally a song for voice and piano. Of course, I won't sing in German, so don't worry. Um, the interesting thing about Liszt is that he learned a lot from others. And you know, maybe someone like Paganini, he just was there and he was Paganini. But Liszt was not like that. He absorbed from many others. And you know, he started with this virtuosity thing, which you've been hearing. And it was the trend in those days, in Paris in the 1830s, partially because of piano construction. You see this metal frame here, this cast iron frame. Well, that was a new thing at that time, and it enabled those loud, crazy octaves and things. So this was mocked in some circles, too. You ever heard of um, Dreyschock, the pianist composer? He, he was well known at the time. Well, one critic said that he played so loudly that if the wind was right, you could hear him in Vienna from Paris. <laughs> so this was mocked. And Liszt, too, the greatness of Liszt is that he's not just a dry shot. He could do all that. But he, you know, it's like Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. He, he, was, he had poise, and he absorbed poeticism from Schubert, who was an unknown composer at that time. Short lived, you know. And also Chopin. I'm going to play those two. They had a huge influence on Liszt. So, um, yeah, let's, the, the serenade is just one of these beautiful melodies. I, I think it's strange. I know he was from Vienna. He's the only of those composers in the 18th, in the ninth, early 19th century that was actually born in Vienna. Haydn was not, Mozart was not, etc. cetera. But I, you know, Schubert, I read, was part Eastern European. Of course, Austro-Hungary is, was what it was. And I hear a Hungarian flavor in this somewhere.
to mention, how on earth does, does this have to do with the violin theme? It's a song, it's a lead in German. Well, Misha Elman, the violinist, great Odessa born violinist, by the way, <laughs> Russian talk, yeah. Um, he was uh, Misha Elman. My mom's not, not from Odessa, but she's from Moscow. But it's Ukraine. <laughs> yes, it's in Ukraine, right. So Misha Elman was, um, he did an arrangement for violin of this that I've been listening to a lot. Uh, listening to. So this, that counts, I guess, for the program. Uh, the next piece, what was, what was it? Oh, Chopin, yeah. This is also, this is a, the first original piano piece I'm playing the whole evening so far. Maybe the last two, I don't remember. Um, and he, of course, wrote this as an early piece. And it's, he wrote it for his cousin who was preparing to play his second concerto. And it has the themes of that concerto. It's a young, it's an early Chopin. And of course, uh, Nathan Zilstein, another Odessa horn violinist, arranged this for the violin. I've been listening to numerous people play it, including him. So that's why this piece fits on the program. You hear two things, two ingredients of the Chopin stew, I would call it. That's not very nice, maybe. But one is the um, Polish folk music we'll hear. <laughs> Second is this Italian opera idea. He was very inspired by Bel Canto opera by Bellini and Donizetti. So some people say the left hand is the orchestra. And then, sorry, this song, I'm not going to sing. You know. <laughs> and then on the, in the right hand is the prima donna, you know, the singer. And so there it is, translated into the piano. Um, this piece is, is a famous piece, and it was in the great movie by Roman Polanski, The Pianist. You may have seen it. Uh, it's this is kind of the theme of that movie. So. Thank you. 
Yeah, Chopin is, um, I'm profoundly uncomfortable playing Chopin. He's so uh, exposed, I feel like a cow on ice when I play him. <laughs> I mean, it's not, not the music, is the, it's just so great, that's what I mean. And it's just, the, there's nowhere to hide. It's like Mozart. Um, yeah, so that's, that's Chopin. The next piece, what was the next piece? Is it Far A? <laughs> Pardon me, it's been a long day. So this is, um, this is a piece, it's a song also for voice originally in French. And it's played a lot on violin and also cello. It's arranged for all those things. This is called Après un rêve, After a Dream. Sorry, my French pronunciation is bad. But um, it's, you know, it's very French. It has these chords, which to me reminds me of um, the sauce in French food. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's very atmospheric. And if, if you look at the dates of Faure, they actually more line up with um, Monet and Renoir than Debussy. So something to think about. Debussy hated the term impressionist, by the way. So maybe Faure was the real impressionist. I don't know. <laughs> This is, a, this is a violin piece, it's famous as a violin piece, but Elgar himself arranged it for piano. Why would composers arrange and rearrange their own 
music. I hate to put it bluntly, for money. They would uh, write an orchestral piece like Brahms and the symphony, and then he'd arrange it for four hands, sell more copies, you know. So, and plus that, his arrangements are great, I think. So, this is Elgar's own arrangement. I've added a few things. Elgar wrote this for his wife, his fiance, and they stayed together. So it was, I guess it worked. And, um, you know, this is, uh, well, Elgar was interesting. He was Catholic, and, and but British at the same time, so he stood out. He felt sort of an outcast. But he's also, in many ways, the most stereotypically English British composer. So here it is. It's just a beautiful piece. These are all kind of, we call them salon pieces, not for the big concert hall, for, for this is what it is. star too, like the person. So this was, he had this dichotomy in his personality. So he um, is about to be ordained, but he's, there's the piano there, so he starts playing. And the nuns all faint. 
<laughs> you know, the bishop comes and says, you know, get out. <laughs> but I think that his, his religious convictions were, were real. That's not something, you know, it wasn't just a silly thing. It was a real thing, and it shows in this. The quick story about this piece, the, uh, this legend of St. Francis walking on the water, St. Francis of Paolo, not Assisi, it's another one. He uh, got to the Straits of Messina, which is the bottom of Italy, to go to Sicily, and there was stormy water, and the uh, boatmen all said, oh, you're a holy man, so why don't you walk across? So he said, okay. <laughs> According to the story, that is. Yeah. All right, and this will be it, I promise. <laughs>
Kevin Richard. Uh, this is Serenade in Blue as played by Pearl Garner.